Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 38. As always, I'm Mark. Here with me today is Matt. Didn't you say 28 on the, the sheet? I wasn't prepared for 38. It's 38. 38, okay. Your your Google Doc says 28. Off to a great start, Mark. It's fine. Everyone knows how pristine my plans are. And then we've got all the way on a train, literally on a train, Orion is here with us also. Hello. By and the magic of the internet. Frankly, it sounds way better with you on the train than when you were in Scotland. Well, you're not in it. I also have a better I have a better headset. <laughs> okay. Oh, helps. that's true, yeah. You're not in a bar or pub. Yeah, there's no one doing dishes. Yeah. <laughs> also that. <laughs> yeah. And today we are here to talk about randomness. Behind the scenes, I think we've had the most debate and discussion we've ever had. It got heated. Podcast got real heated. It got real heated. I got I got perturbed. I was about, perturbed. It was mutual perturbedness. Perturbment. 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 Perturbation. Perturbation. Is that, is a that word? actually perturbation? A word? Perturbation is probably, if I had to guess, but... it sounds very similar to trepidation, but it doesn't. But mean... anyway, <laughs> we had great conversation from the. No, it was good. I was only heated because yeah. I, I cared so much and found it interesting. Yeah, that's why I like arguing with you guys. Yeah. Because we care. We have great arguments. We do. It's very nice. Anyways. It's more fun arguing with you guys than my fiance. Oh, man. <laughs> You're pretty confident she's not listening to this. <laughs> well, I am, for one. <laughs> I mean, there are many other forms of talking that I would choose to participate with her over you i mean my but amber, arguing specifically my amber and i get in i mean I, yeah there are arguments but we love it it's like a form of recreation for us and i remember distinctly like i don't know if it was you matt or you orion i know wes at one point got really concerned because you we guys were... sound really upset like you sound like you're getting really upset and i have learned that you will never stay mad at each other, so it doesn't bother me as much as it may be used to. But in the moment, you like you guys are intensely arguing, and it sounds like you're really annoyed at the other person of like, why can't you understand this? This is the most obvious thing ever. Yeah, it's a weird state to be in. We just kind of fall into it, and we both enjoy it. Yeah. Mostly. Yeah, I mean, there have been a couple times where we had to like call it off mid-argument about something. And it's usually about something philosophical or yeah. kind of head in the clouds yeah. but well y you're kind of head in the clouds and amber is more practical right yeah tip generally it's the same with me and my amber yeah but, but uh, your amber's a lawyer so yes <laughs> trained in argumentation <laughs> my as am, am i my amber works in medicine because she likes to care for people yes not argue with them <laughs> <laughs> it's fair <laughs> Anyways, all of that to say that, that was, yeah. we never actually resolved really our argument. I kind of understand what you are talking about more. We got to the point where we can argue about it now. Yes. And that's where we wanted to get. Yeah, we'll get to that, though. But we're talking about randomness and uncertainty. Uh, mostly randomness. We'll stick with that, I think. Because uncertainty is, is such a broad topic. But we've been wanting to do this podcast for a while and I wanted to get through Greg uh, Kostakayan's Uncertainty in Games book, which I gave a glowing review to on the website first. And I wanted to have some time to prepare and brainstorm for this one because I think the topic's super interesting. And the book's really great, but I think we're going to not go as broad as that book. We're going to stick with randomness as however we define that, which I guess is the first part of what we need to do is... I mean, apparently we don't agree on that. Yeah, we don't really... I don't know. Here's the thing. There's a lot of uncertainty. I, I, I feel like I intuitively understand the difference between randomness and uncertainty. When, but when I tried to come down and like define it of like, how do I distinguish these terms? Because I think there's some overlap. The best thing I came up with, with was agency, but that seemed kind of weak. So Yeah, yeah Orion, yeah. I'll, I'm going to talk a bit about Kostakayan's book first, and then we'll get into defining things. And Matt and I came to, or I came to, a very bizarre way of delineating randomness and uncertainty. Basically that, to exclude all the things that I want to talk about. 
No. <laughs> no, no, no. That, <laughs> That's not true. That doesn't seem like it works. It, it seems like a very sloppy way of defining things. But I really like the way Kostakayan framed everything, where he's like, okay, we're going to talk about uncertainty and how it's a key component in games, and randomness is a part of that. So it's under the subset of uncertainty, which I think is kind of colloquially how gamers understand those words. And through my discussions with Matt, I'm more convinced that it's not that clear. But I think it works kind of in conversation. So the the types of uncertainty that Kostakayan talks about are like uh, uncertainty of what your opponents are going to do, uncertainty of like analytic uncertainty of, of just the immense puzzle in front of you, uncertainty of your own skills. So in a dexterity game or most video games, you have the kind of, I think he calls it performative uncertainty, along with other things. But randomness is just one part of that or chance. So I kind of like that, but it's very, very hard to pin down anything coherent in defining those terms. It's helpful when we're talking in a games context, you know, loose, not like strict like game theory or, or whatever which may be different or, or something really technical with, with programming or logic. But in just a board games context, I think it's helpful to have randomness be one part of the set of uncertainty. So when we get to trying to distinguish that, and if that's our goal because we think that's kind of a useful way to frame randomness, it's like Orion was saying, it's something where it's like, I know it when I see it, but then when you think about it further, it kind of breaks down. So it's like, okay, what if it's outside? What if it's just uncertain things outside the player's agency? And then you get to questions of whose players agencies and ultimately, well, I'm just going to say ultimately it devolves into metaphysical questions about the nature of reality, but we're going to not talk about that. But just recognize that ultimately... Yeah, did you mention whose agency? Because I know that came up in our discussion earlier. Right, because it's a, it's a really like, subjective thing, randomness. Like, Yeah, it's easy to, it's easy to point to like a, flipping a coin and say that is random. Right. But if you think about it, if someone flips a coin, sees the result and hides it, to the person who's guessing it's a random result, but to the person who's seen the result already it it's, yeah. has ceased to be random even though it's the same moment in time in the same physical object yeah n- not that i have an answer at this moment but at some point i mean we're talking about randomness as it pertains to playing a game or maybe designing a game any strict definition might break down in this conversation sure well then you can say okay well things that another player is determining or actions they're taking aren't random because it's a person determining that. But from the perspective of an opponent, it can feel random. And then you threw, of course, the AI example. What if the opponent was an AI? That Does it then become random right, even right. if the same... Even if you're looking at a scenario where the same move was made yeah. or something like that. And does that. it matter if it's a deterministic AI or not? Yeah, which... I mean, that was the point of our pre-discussion where I'm like, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for this, but I also don't care as much. Like, that's sure. an interesting discussion, yeah. but maybe not an interesting one for this particular podcast. So, Ryan, here's something that I came up with on the spot earlier, and it sounds really dumb, but I think it might work. Something is uncertain if you can't predict it with certainty, right? As you as the agent, as the observer, from your perspective, if there's doubt as to what is going to happen, that's uncertain. Easy enough. Randomness is, and again, I'm, this is something I'm just spitballed and came up with, but randomness is something that the collective knowledge of the players can't predict, of every participant in the game, together. Oh, I think that's so, so basically, if everyone played face up or hands up or whatever... Sort of. Or if you if you can imagine a uh, another oh, like party a, a, that if, had if, the collective knowledge of all those people, for for so if, like an if, easy if, if it's like the if it's like the iRobot short story with the robot that can read people's minds and tries to make them happy. 
don't so know. if you had that robot, it's too late to be that going. Robot could do also this. not determine the answer or the result. Right. So that so the point is that removes things like opponent uncertainty from randomness, but keeps things like flipping a uh, a card over from a deck in in sure. the category of random. Right. I, okay. I haven't I thought of something where it breaks least. it down. I feel like it'll break it's down easy. at some point, but that might be an interesting way to draw the line. Even Again, it seems very clumsy. It's incredibly yeah. clumsy, and I think it would break down very quickly as well. But I don't know where it breaks down. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's the problem. The thing I wanted to talk about breaks it well we'll get to that in a bit matt and that's not my i don't need to get to that i'm letting you drive this conversation Um, but just as a tidbit i i know you guys know more about this than i do and this is going back to the more kind of metaphysical discussion but i think it's really interesting is that i didn't realize until i saw i believe a number file video on it that's a great youtube channel that i i keep up with about how computers generate random numbers and that in computer science that's actually a very difficult problem that people have been trying to figure out. And there are a handful of different ways they do it. I don't remember what the kind of common way is that most computers would do it now. Do, are yeah. you guys aware? Um, I big, forget what it is. The big thing in Orion, maybe you know this more precisely, is by basically doing a large modulo division uh, using prime numbers i think like you can make a simple pr- random number generator by like multiplying by something and then taking the modulo 17 over and over again and if you do that in a certain way you can generate bits okay that you get mm. pseudo random numbers orion in your computer science knowledge are you aware of any more specifics the most common way i've seen well I, I'll, there's two that i'm most aware of one Back when I was in school, in our C++ programming, there was basically a giant number circle that was randomly distributed. But if you just called get rand or whatever the whatever the function was, it would give you the same number every time unless you gave it a seed. So the seed is basically choosing a unpredictable spot around the number circle to start walking from. And in that sense you're generating random numbers because you couldn't reproduce it without knowing the seed. Um, what would the seed But obviously that, be? that's a that's Well, it a could be anything. Way. I mean, if you've played Minecraft, when you generate a new world, you can type in a seed. All that is is a string that gets converted to bits, and then... It's basically it's, a fancy way of doing an offset. Yeah, and then basically... But that, it's like, is it like a number you input? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It breaks down. To so yeah, so it breaks it's down like in... Configuration. Like, the most common way we did is just grab the time in milliseconds or something and use that as our seed. So that if okay. you ran it again two seconds from now, you'd get a completely different yeah, set but, of numbers. Yeah, so you have I to mean, find the, some way to try to... The, the point is, it's a relatively simple mathematical operation involving, you know, numbers that are big enough that you wouldn't want to do it by hand. Mm-hmm primey numbers right but, but for a computer it's arithmetic and trivial yeah, yeah. and then you're the just question... doing the same thing over and over again spitting yeah. out a random sequence pseudo random sequence yeah it's yeah. The, the obvious thing is that it by very strict definitions it can never be actually random but it's random enough that it doesn't really matter for practical purposes yeah i mean and, and right. this is a, a whole uh, we could go on tangents so far. Yeah, I'm just I just want but, to dip our toes in like, this one. It's a real problem for certain situations like uh, cryptography. So like when you get into sec- the security world, mm. it's not enough to just use a built-in random number generator or stuff like that. There are whole parts of computer science and mathematics that break down to like if we can solve this problem that we don't know that we can solve, it will make all it would it would basically make all network traffic on the internet inherently unsecure. Interesting. I think it's tangential. I mean, yeah. the, the kind of the point where it touches is that true randomness is extremely difficult to find. Yeah. Because basically, everywhere you look is based on some pattern. If you drill far enough down. Yeah. And if yeah. you can find that pattern or solve the mathematical equation, then you can predict the next number, which means 
it's not a random sequence. I, I think I remember in the number file video, the guy who was explaining this had a few different ways he built up of generating random numbers. And one of them had to do with the decay of a certain isotope. Yeah. And you'd pick one of the decimal points of whatever was reading the decay of sure. that thing. And that, that was like his favorite way of doing it. I mean, there, Joshua, there you're using quantum physics. Yeah. Which in our is metaphysical sense you might say is a more true random than anything that you could do in a new newtonian world sure we're not going to get into that one <laughs> i don't want to i don't want to go into anything that's dealing with quantum joshua in the chat pointed out that there's some place he says there's some place that takes a picture of fish in fish tanks to gen randomly generate seed keys for encryption that is an ingenious way of randomly generating yeah a seed yeah, key yeah. something to do with fish swimming yeah. around or you could have, anything with like fluid dynamics would be pretty yeah random, or just right? noise i mean yeah. all a picture is is essentially noise yeah um so like you can imagine a system that like takes a barometric reading you know you could have just a simple thing inside of your computer that takes the air pressure mm -hmm. and, and uses yeah. that to seed yeah. randomness. Yeah. This it's is so relevant to board games. Awesome. Well, I was going to pull this back. Watch this. So you have a level of randomness that's that's important for things like computer security. Pulling back, you have randomness through something like dice, where in Vegas they have to have dice with straight, hard-cornered edges because if you had uh, kind of rounded edges at it can be fiddled with easier or it can roll less true. And then in board games, we just go with whatever they give us in the box <laughs> and we're fine with it. And we don't even shuffle our decks of cards seven times to get like the 99 point, whatever degree of, of randomness that that gives you. Sometimes you only shuffle it like three or four times. We're okay with that. So that is the realm we're going to be talking about randomness in with our uh, non riffle shuffles and, really really rounded dice i think memoir 44 is the worst for those rounded dice those are like oh spheres. yeah spheres nearly and they're spheres. like light wood uh like i like that game but man those dice i wish they were better so the next thing i wanted to talk about now that we've gotten all the weird philosophical stuff out of the way is something that's really pertinent to board gaming and that is input and output randomness uh which is a phrase coined by jeff Engelstein in ludology uh, the Ludology podcast. And the idea is that you have, you can have randomness on either side of the player's decision point. So you mm -hmm. can have randomness that gives the player the context for their decision, what we call input randomness. And then you can give players, you can have players make a decision and then randomly determine some or all of the outcome of that decision. So, you know, in a traditional kind of dice chucking dungeon crawler, you decide to attack something, or in an RPG, you decide to ad attack something, and then you roll the die, and that determines whether or not you hit, or how much damage you apply to the monster. That's output randomness. Input randomness is something like a dice drafting game, like Castles of Burgundy. You roll the dice first, you see what the dice are, and then you make your decisions based on yeah. the constraints that that randomness gives you. Yeah, we should say that I typically call this pre-decision and post-decision randomness, which I think is more descriptive, but input output... It sounds output, less cool. I frankly don't know if I agree with that, <laughs> but I'm okay with input-output randomness. That's also... Yeah, because it's still about the decision, so... Yeah. Typically, from kind of a Eurogamer point of view, you would prefer input randomness, and I think we would all agree with that. I mean, we certainly enjoy games that have output ran randomness. Like, we all enjoy think, Twilight Imperium, and that has a substantial amount of it. Yeah, I think a lot of the discussion about what's okay or, or how games use randomness well or poorly, I think a lot of that discussion revolves around the output randomness. Input randomness is... It, it's hard to find a situation where that's a bad thing. And, and I think in most... Yeah, like, I think Castles of Burgundy is an excellent example what makes Castles of Burgundy different one time to the next time? It's that every round starts with a slightly different set of kind of randomized parameters. 
that kick off all the, de- the decisions. Well, it has also two layers. You have the set of tokens that are available that round. Right. And then each turn you have your dice that are rolled that, that provides some input randomness. And, and the idea with input randomness is that it just makes the decisions more impactful. Because... Impactful? Uh, it, or, or at least feel more impactful, I think. It, it feels it, like you have more control over things. Well, it feels like you have more control over things. I don't know if the way you phrased it I would agree with. It makes the yeah, decision probably. more interesting because you're not making the same decision over and over again every time you play. It makes the decisions more interesting because you're... Oh, in terms of variability, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean... As far as variability in, in in a heavy Euro game, it's it's usually completely input randomness. Yeah, I think that's what people strive towards. Yeah, I think I think the impact thing still stands because when you have only input randomness, you can follow a direct line between the causal nature of your action and the result of that. Whereas when you have output randomness, you get the situation which is psychologically troubling where you can effectively lose a turn or lose an action or yeah. waste some yeah. time yeah. or lose something that you thought you would gain yeah. or lose something that you had. Yeah, sorry. In the direct comparison between the two, you're, I think you're right. It, it makes it feel more directly impactful because when you make the decision, you've 100% gotten the result. Yes. Because the randomness happened before you made the decision. Yeah. But I mean, I think some example, I, and again, I think in a very generalized sense, I, I would agree with most people that input randomness is to be preferred. But we can see some really interesting cases where games employ both. And Dominion was the example that I think came to everyone's mind when we were planning for this because it has elements of both input and output randomness. There's more input because you're drawing your hand of cards and that's your input randomness and you have things to do with. But you can play cards to draw additional cards during your turn. The timing of how you play cards out can have an effect on on, on that and you can take different risks based on what cards you think you're going to draw. It's not as significant as many output randomness situations, but it is there. See, I don't know if, the, if I would choose Dominion as as it as an example for input output randomness because most of dominion is or a lot of dominion is output randomness how so no, no i guess it, no. it it depends it depends so much on the strategy sorry i was just thinking of like a chaining well, deck i mean the really interesting thing about dominion's randomness is is that deck management i think and you're building a deck and you have complete control over what goes into your deck unless you're playing with curses or whatever but you you mostly have complete control over what goes into your deck but what you don't have control over is exactly which five cards you draw so in a sense that's your input randomness but on a macro scale you you kind of do have control right yeah yeah, yeah. it's certainly control randomness um, like you're it's it's you know you could call it a type of bounded randomness so that, you're, that so, you are affecting yeah. directly. Sorry. So I guess I'm just getting muddled at, at as this as our example. So what's the input randomness? The in, cards you draw. The cards you draw. And the output randomness is really it's only like if you're drawing other cards. That's the main way I think. Yeah. yeah. There are some other effects, some attacks that have output randomness involved. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know where opponents flip a card and maybe you can steal one of them. Those kinds of cards. Yeah. I think I'll just throw something out here and say that some amount of bounded output randomness makes a game better because it allows for skillful play. It forces you into a situation where there is some uncertainty and you are forced to evaluate the way your options and try to make the best play. And sometimes it won't work out, but I think it, that makes it more interesting than... Yeah purely the opposite or pure, well purely either way if it's purely deterministic from the point where you draw your hand or completely random where literally anything could happen at that point your decision becomes meaningless but yeah so well, one one thing that you said that that i liked is is the idea of bounding the randomness 
right? And I mean, as a game design principle, that's kind of the important thing is, is how do you want to bound the randomness to give the players a certain experience? Yeah, and, and when you're adding output randomness to a game, what you're effectively doing is sacrificing some level of strategy for excitement, right? And suspense. That's not completely true, but I, I see what you're saying. What, what do you mean by that? The strategy so, becomes so you less... Can, you, can, you can control the distribution of the randomness oh, sure. over, over time. So while you're right in, you know... Ruling a die in one situation does what you said. It, it sacrifices strategy for excitement. But if you're going to do that 10 times over the course of the game, then you have a much better idea of what the results are going to be. You as a player oh, sure. uh, understand. Or if you allow things like stacking dice modifiers. Oh, yeah. no. But, but, but from I'm the not saying that. Yeah. But compared to a, a perfect information zero randomness game, if you add a little bit of output randomness that is on the margin going to have a little bit less skill involved in the in the outcome which in in most cases i would argue is a good thing i typically don't like non-random purely strategic games as much as i like games with some randomness that is the trade-off that's happening now obviously there are great ways to again I'll give the players agency in bounding that randomness and i think risks risk assessment type decisions that you get with with randomness and it could even be input randomness in like phases of the game right because yeah you could have a randomized setup at the beginning and the game play out more or less zero randomness after that or like castles of burgundy you can have different tiers sure. of resetting that input like, randomness like which then becomes kind of its own I guess you don't you're not determining like you're you're still doing the risk assessment type decisions that you would have with a game in which you roll dice to determine some measure of the outcome. Right, right. And so, so like, like the strategy is not as intense and it also shifts into kind of this risk assessment framework, which personally I love. That you keep saying that the strategy is not as intense. I don't know that I agree with that. The strategy shifts to a more risk management framework. That's definitely true. By intense, but, I mean that the better player will win on average less. Sure. But, but that's but not I a matter of the strategy. That's just a matter of the random distribution. That's what I mean by having not quite as, yeah. okay. not quite as much strategy. I don't like that phrasing, but I. But you see understand what, you're what you mean? Yeah, I it, see what it you're is saying. poor for phrasing there. Yeah. So, like it, the the obvious example, if you go way to one end, is like chess or Go, which you know, no randomness, purely deterministic, purely skill based, where that skill is calculating possible moves and evaluating them. Right. So I'm saying, if you add a little bit of randomness to that framework you're probably you're sacrificing some of that skill dependency on the outcome and you're adding some measure of randomness dependency on the outcome to varying degrees obviously yeah like i mean you, you enter a, a basically a linear scale so one game that we occasionally c compare to chess is twilight struggle right twilight struggle has a fair number of random things in it oh a healthy number yeah but i don't think you would say that the strategy is greatly stymied by the fact that there are random elements because the framework of risk management or the framework of, of, of some of the things you know are, are random but will add up to a certain thing by oh, the sure. end of the game it's all about managing that in in no way does that limit the strategy it limits it a bit right so a chess grandmaster is going to beat me at chess 99.99 whatever percent of the time whatever the equivalent is of a twilight struggle grandmaster will beat me maybe 98 percent of the time like there's there's still a ton of skill in twilight struggle i'm just saying in a very abstract sense when you add randomness you're taking away some measure of yeah, the skill dependency so. on the outcome i mean one way to think of it and maybe this is how i'm thinking of it is if you played a Twilight Struggle Grandmaster a hundred times or a thousand times or an infinite number of times, he's going to beat you. But I would I would get more wins in than in the chess comparison. Yeah. That that's all Based I'm saying. On the random 
Yeah. Right. Sure. It, it, and Twilight Struggle is a great example because it does have a healthy amount of randomness, which generates a lot of intrigue and excitement and variability and all kinds of good, interesting stuff that we translate as fun. And yet it's still highly skill dependent at the same time. So it like manages to do both. I feel both. like you're shorting it. Like it's it's a brutal 1v1 strategic experience where, I mean, it, it's not chess, but it's as close to that as modern board gaming gets. No, no way. I think it's healthily on that side, but it's not as close as it gets. There's a good amount of luck in Twilight Struggle. I get what you're saying, Mark, but I don't like the implication that randomness decreases skill um it's just that the outcome is less deterministic <laughs> yes I wanna... because i i think i think risk assessment and probabilistic analysis is a skill in and of itself and so to take it to kind of the other end something like poker which basically everything that happens in the game is random other than your betting but there's a huge amount of skill in poker in understanding the probabilities and not necessarily counting cards but knowing the possible outcomes and weighing probabilities and reading people and all of that that can also just as easily be called skill although it's certainly something different than I, a chess grandmaster i i think we all agree here my point is that in a vacuum that trade-off exists. Okay. But I think we can all agree that there's a very, very wide I have boundary a, for how much randomness maybe, there can be yeah, while may, still having a lot of skill. Maybe a way to think of it. So when, when we think about randomness, y you might consider a nor normal curve. Everyone's seen this curve. It's basically a... A bell curve. A bell curve. Yeah. A bell curve. A normal curve. It's very well defined mathematically. You don't need to understand that to get the importance of it. You have kind of a peak, which is the most likely thing to happen. And then it has a width, which is a standard deviation. Basically, how much on average the outcome will veer from the average, right? So in my mind, increasing that standard deviation, kind of flattening out that probability curve, doesn't really have anything to do with a discussion about skill. So as Orion said, the outcome is less deterministic as you flatten that probability curve, but the amount of skill required is an kind of independent thing. I don't think so. And, and, it's... and poker is a great, great example because it has an extremely wide distribution, but I think people agree that p poker is all skill. It's not all skill. Well, sorry, it, it, sorry. It's a big amount. That's the, that's the what I'm saying. Say I'm it. saying there's. Yeah. I'm saying there's a wide amount of randomness that games can basically endure while still having a lot of skill play a factor, right? But that doesn't mean that the trade off doesn't exist. It just means that in many cases in a well designed game, it's not super meaningful to the experience, which is why we can have great games that that do value skill and create super interesting puzzles and, and things to ponder with a lot of randomness involved. So I think we agree on this, just coming at it from different angles. Yeah, I think our our mindsets in thinking about randomness are more different than I would have guessed prior to the discussion. Uh, yeah, it, it is interesting how we come in like everything we've talked about, especially you and I, Matt, in preparing for this and discussing these things. This has been the most like conflict we've had so far in terms of how we're perceiving things in our ideas. I find it super yeah. interesting. Yeah, it is. But that's basically all I wanted to say in terms of input output randomness. We really didn't lot... talk about input and output randomness. We talked about much. it a bit. We, <laughs> we tangented. So if you have anything else you want to say on it, but I mean, you, we could do an entire episode on that. Maybe we, we will someday, but it's something to always think about in terms of evaluating we, we kind of touched on this but input randomness is that we associate with euros and i think output randomness in the same way we associate with the merry trash games right oh i, I like i would completely I mean, agree you think yeah. about the classics that like risk is one of the most frustrating examples of output randomness done poorly yeah yeah and and so i think as is the case in a lot of these discussions in this golden age of board gaming that we find ourselves in, 
where Euros and Ameritrash are mixing and it's beautiful. Interbreeding. Interbreeding. Frolicking in the fields of fun. Yeah, it's just (laughs) impassioned board game creation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, these things are combined. Yeah, and (laughs) in terms of like the amount of randomness you have in the game, I think the real determinant for how much enjoyment you get out of the game, there's a lot of factors that are involved there, but it comes down more to, I think, the perception of having control yeah, rather than kind of a strict, if you were to chart mathematically the amount of randomness or the, you know, how flat that bell curve is, huh. uh, yeah. which is an interesting point, which we'll get to more, I think, when we talk about chaos later on foreshadowing. And I think there's like two things that go into that. One is the bounded randomness that we talked about of having bounded outcomes, basically, so that you have, there's some limit limits on what can happen and you can make some estimates of, or you can have an expectation of what will happen if you did it a million times. And then the other thing is that games are all about interesting decisions. And I think we can agree that there are interesting decisions in chess and there are interesting decisions in poker and there are interesting decisions all throughout the middle. Yeah, absolutely. In a good game. Or I, I will say a good game can be anywhere on that spectrum of spectrum of amount of randomness and still have interesting decisions if it's done well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so I guess the conclusion is that randomness is really on how you implement it within the kind of the mechanical structure or the thematic structure of the game. More so than yeah. just pure quantity or amount of randomness. Yeah. Maybe maybe let's talk about risk a tiny bit more. Sure. Risk, is it fair to say it's all output randomness? I mean, w- there's really no randomness in the in the situations that you're presented with. I cannot think of a, any bit of input um, I randomness. Guess, I guess the cards that you draw, you draw one card per turn, and then you can eventually turn them in for bonuses. Right, but there's no decision to be made there. Uh, That's yeah. all output. Like, as soon as you get a set, you're going to turn it in. Yeah, it There's might... There's no real decision there. Well, it might affect which regions you're going to pursue or something like that. But that's a really tiny amount. Yeah. Compared to the entire game is saying, I'm going to attack that thing, and then rolling die over and over and over again to see how many troops you lose. Yeah. It... Well, and then, But we have games, again, like Twilight Imperium, that have similar battle resolution things, but... Yeah. So you feel like, and you do have a whole lot more control over the parameters of that battle. Right. And the process of getting to the battle is the most fun part of the game. The battle itself, the game isn't hinged on the battles being fun. The rest of right. the game is really the meat of it. Th- that Those battles are the, the climax, the payoff for so much positioning and, and politicking at the table. You could compare Twilight Imperium to Axis and Allies, which has essentially the same battle resolution system and mm-hmm. the same random way of using dice to determine outcomes of the conflicts, but they feel totally separate to play. Oh, yeah. And there are other reasons well, because, for that. But... And I haven't actually played Axis and Allies, but the way that it presents you with decisions is basically the same way that Risk does, right? Like, you have a bunch of regions on the board with units on them, and then you yeah. point to one and say, I attack it. The kind of upgrades from risk is that you have a certain amount of income and you choose to spend it on some collection of units that have different strengths, yeah, different right. situations. Right. The other thing with Axe and Allies, who a team, and there's very much an us versus them, you know, Axis versus Allies, it's in the name. There's also no catch-up re- mechanisms in Axis and Allies. Yeah. Not strictly speaking, the balancing factor that I've found is kind of supply line because you mostly can deploy units in your home regions and it takes time to get them out to the front. Yeah, that's not much though. So Once I've you gotten capture... situations, most recently I played Germany and was pushing into, no, 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 it's, 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 it's not much compared to other things for sure. But that's more of a modeling the difficulty of invading another country more so than a catch-up mechanic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, we don't have a ton of games with that level of output randomness. I'm looking at Descent or Imperial Assault, and those are games you kind of have to go in knowing there's a lot of it. And they're probably actually closer yeah. to feeling like Risk than Twilight Imperium in terms of how much 
the dice rolling affects the game. Yeah. But you still yeah, make, and you it still is... make so many more interesting decisions right, right. there. And it's I guess it's important like like what percentage of the game is actually resolving those output things. In risk, it's like three fourths of the game or yeah, pretty much more, maybe. Which is why it doesn't it doesn't feel great. Yeah. Especially after you've played any other game. In Imperial Assault, there's just a lot more going on. So it's maybe like 25% of the game or 20% of the game. Yeah, and you can but, do more to affect, again, and, and rebind kind of the, the random parameters there. Yeah. Which I guess segues pretty nicely into the next topic, which is bounded randomness, which we talked about a bit, and then white and pink noise, which is something I originally heard, again, from Jeff Engelstein in a great talk that's somewhere online where he talks about different types of noise and different types of randomness, which is, it originally comes from computer science or physics? Um, More ele- electrical engineering. Orion, what would it be? I mean, it's like uh, physics. Physics, really. Sure. Really just physics. All science is ultimately physics, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so white noise is just randomness with an e- even distribution you know, in physics, even distribution across all frequencies. Yeah. So, but, a, so a, a, a typical die would yeah, be white noise. Yeah. You rule a six-sided die. If you rule it a thousand times, you'll get this roughly the same number of each of the six numbers. Pink noise is randomness in proportion to the power. So, in physics, as frequency increases, the kind of amount of energy in that wave or or whatever the amount of energy increases so the amplitude we decrease so you end up with this nice uh exponential curve more or less so anyway all that to say games in games you can do you can do all kinds of interesting things in terms of changing the random parameters so again going back to like descent or imperial assault stronger characters were well We'll be rolling different quantities and different types of dice based on the strength of that character, which will still be a random outcome, but okay, will be slightly stronger yeah. compared to a weaker character. So, so yeah. So with pink noise, you're basically saying it's it's a random distribution, but you like designed into the experience is a, a nonlinear distribution, basically. Sure. Yeah. Just as an aside, kind of. Not re- well, maybe not related to this, but um, I was reading in a book recently, and they were saying how the frequency of earthquakes and the magnitude of earthquakes, if you plot them on the Richter scale, is basically a perfect, almost a exactly straight line. And so over time, you can predict the number of earthquakes that will happen of a certain magnitude just based on the magnitude. <laughs> so based on that, you could say we expect a 7.0 earthquake every five years in san francisco or something like that based on historical frequency of small earthquakes and you can just draw this power line down and predict rare events or not predict when they will happen but predict the overall frequency of them based on the frequency of much more common lower magnitude events that and that's true pink noise i think because the low magnitude ones you expect to have happen way more than that super rare but extreme earthquake. I mean, that's that's basically what pink noise is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of that, I'm not sure I can think of any board game instances of actual pink noise. Or actually, so actually an example would be in D&D, like the crit. The crit oh, yeah. is kind of the, the extreme event that happens much rare. And then you have kind of moderate successes that happen more often. Correct. And there there are also games, or at least there are dice that have been created that play with the distribution of numbers. Yeah. So I know there's a set, you can easily create kind of a few, I can't remember how many, but a few different types of D6s that have the same average, but different standard deviations. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I think that kind of thing games should utilize more. Absolutely. Like it's super it's, interesting. It's really crazy to think that we pretty much use even distribution die. And we, and we make bell curves just by like giving them multiple dice. Yeah, yeah. When which is some, fair. Which is fine. 
and it keeps a kind of a, a, a normal distribution, but games, there's so much space there to deal with distributions that aren't I mean, normal. W- w- one example, the examples I can think are more with custom dice. So like Armada, Star Wars Armada, mm-hmm. like, you know, you might roll the, the red dice, which have, well, I don't really know the distributions, but <laughs> might have like a better chance of, of hitting, but don't hit as hard or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a bit of that in Armada, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I guess that's the only place you really see it, that I've seen at least, is in custom dice and fantasy flight games. But it's something I think it's really cool to look into in terms of design, especially with dice. Don't you also have it in like a deck, deck builder or something? Or when you, you're drawing modifiers from a deck, where the most oh, common thing yes. is like a plus one, but there's like one plus three or one crit in the deck? Yeah, like so, Gloomhaven. So drawing from a deck is kind of different in fundamental ways. But yeah, I think Gloomhaven is the perfect example where you start with kind of um, a white noise deck that modifies your attacks. and then, Relatively white noise. Well, relatively white yeah, noise. Yeah. You know, there's some minus twos, plus twos, minus ones, plus ones. But then as you progress your character, you you can influence the makeup of that deck in very different ways. Pandemic is kind of an example of this once you're in the game because you will have typically how the game plays out is you have on the top of the whatever the deck is called there you'll have a set of cards where a number of them will be more or less fine still negative but fine consequences and then a couple maybe one or two will be really catastrophic which you know gets to my criticism of Pandemic in the end game but in the mid game it's really compelling. Yeah, I mean, when they were designing Pandemic, I think that it's kind of interesting. Like, they obviously put a lot of thought into how you shuffle the deck. And it's kind of a lot of work up front to, you know, divide the deck into five piles, shuffle one Epidemic card into each of the five piles. Um, But you can tell, like, there's a randomness there, but it's a very carefully crafted randomness that gives kind of an average experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's let's move on from that and go to this idea of chaos, which is where Whoa. a lot of the pre podcast debating was centered around. Because you and you we're talking about chaos. Where Matt's talking about kind of the idea of chaotic things in physics, mostly. Is that kind of the no? It, it's it's the math idea of chaos theory. Okay, where so mathematical all variations are in input input makes large variations in output yeah to the point of the system being un, uh, almost impossible to model because you can't get enough si- significant digits on your inputs to be able to properly calculate out and extrapolate out and process the prediction the forecast going forward where were you in our pre-discussion to lay the smack down on marco ryan yeah that was way clearer than like 45 I, I, minutes of talking to matt about i this. just got less and less clear as you guys got <laughs> <laughs> more and more ridiculous in your rejection. I, I love the idea of chaos theory. It's so yeah, it's cool. super interesting. Um, it's super it's interesting. I think it's most... more interesting than it is relevant to board gaming. But yeah, it's it's also conjures up scenes from Jurassic Park, which is an excellent movie. But also, I think the uh, example I was reading about it most recently is in weather prediction, where they used to think like, oh, we should be able to predict the weather once we can, you know, model the humidity and you know, whatever other variables, for example. But they would run the same system, and beyond, like, a week, it's actually negative correlation of their predictions to the outputs because the tiniest, tiniest changes in initial conditions, by the time you get that far out in that complex of a system, has these exponential effects on the output. So that's why we get things like, you know, the butterfly effect of, you know, yeah. a tiny perturbation of the atmosphere a thousand miles away causes a tornado or a hurricane over here. But you can't actually draw that cause effect line because there's so much right. in, noise and data and everything else going on. It, so the way that I, I've been describing it is it's a, kind of it's an emergent randomness from a system that's well defined. We can measure the humidity. We can measure the temperature and we have a rough idea of how those interact so you know the preconditions aren't a mystery the interactions aren't a mystery but the sensitivity of the system to to variations is such that a randomness emerges from 
basically a non-random situation. Right, based on just the granularity. So, so Orion, um, I have I have one example basically that I think is we came up with two moderately interesting. Do you have any examples in board gaming that that you came up with of of situations so, like, that are chaotic? I feel like board games don't have the sort of extremely fine granularity that causes a massive output. Yeah, I yeah, don't know. I think you're right. Like most board games, like the biggest, the most granular initial condition is like the makeup of the deck. But even so, it's generally balanced so that outcomes are roughly within a bounded range. You don't have hurricanes show up in board games, right? I think you're right. And I think this is one type of randomness that you're only ever going to get an approximation of in, in in a tabletop game. So, I mean, we came up with a couple examples. You came up with Diplomacy, which has, you know, up to seven players making simultaneous decisions that then all resolve at once. I think that's similar to the example that I've been giving, which is uh, Dungeon Lords, where there's this action programming mechanic where I and they're essentially the same they're they're extremely similar mechanisms i think it plays out differently they're both simultaneous reveal programming yes but i don't think things. diplomacy is as chaotic a system because diplomacy all the interactions are local the, the reason i drew the parallel is because and this is something we kind of talked about and resolved before but the effect on the game state in a, or the effect on say the odds of different people winning the game can be much more dramatically affected by small miscalculations in diplomacy, whereas Dungeon Lords has more ability to kind of catch up from bad calculations. Yeah. Okay, so let me describe the the Dungeon Lords situation. So in Dungeon Lords, everyone is going to choose three actions to do out of eight. And each of those eight actions has kind of different versions of the same, and which version of the action you get is determined by the order that you reveal that action. So everyone programs one, two, three actions. And once they're all programmed, you reveal in turn around the table, everyone's first action, second action, third action, putting pieces in the respective slots on those eight actions on the board. So where the system, I think, exhibits chaos is that the known information that I have is what I want to do, what I think everyone else wants to do, and what I think everyone else thinks everyone else wants to do. So there's kind of that game theory situation where we're all kind of balancing what everyone wants to do against each other. And then we're trying to jockey for position on these various, the eight action tracks. But when we program our actions in, then it's all programmed and then it all resolves together. And kind of out of that comes results that are are very affected by small miscalculations. So, so the point is, it's not a system that you could possibly fully understand. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I should say in response since we've hashed a lot of this out. I guess my... I don't see it as a chaotic system. I think Orion's right. Like, the granularity isn't there necessarily. I do... No. I think maybe the language to describe this kind of thing is more along the lines of high variance decisions or high leverage decisions. Because your no, criticism... No, that's something different. So and, and, and don't think of it as criticism. Because my enjoyment of Dungeon Lords really isn't relevant. I think it's interesting. I just don't see how it differs that much from other types of decisions where things are affected by the other players in the game. Can you think of another game that has a situation of simultaneous decision where fine details of the output matter in a way where your decision is dependent on every other decision and vice versa i mean any game with simultaneous play libertalia would be a more extreme example probably oh blood rage and rising sun yeah well some aspects of blood rage but rising sun more so rising yeah i mean i just mean the combat but sure yeah yeah. i mean comet is a two-player example of that kind of it's a simultaneous kind of auction reveal in the, in the it's, combat. It's not about not being able to understand someone else's position going into the decision. It's about small variations in decisions made having big, bigger impacts on the outputs. So, so in, in Dungeon Lords, the point is 
you get a different version of the action based on the way that this system plays out. Sure. In something like Comet, it's just the matter of whether or not you win or not. That's rock, paper, scissors. That's not chaotic. Well, no, but there's there's like three different axes it's measured on in Comet. I mean, a Libertalia, sure, it, Libertalia might be the more Libertalia might example because that yes. can start like these weird chain reactions. In right. Dungeon Lords, it's often like you get to do two units of the thing instead of yeah. Three it's units been a long time thing. since I played Libertalia. I think that is the better it, Libertalia. Example. I think is, and, yeah, especially with high player counts. It, yeah, right. two or three player Libertalia is more constrained, right? Because it, it, if you try to go into it to get a certain result, you're just going to be disappointed. Because it's not that you can't try to understand what other people are doing. It's that it's not worth it. In a, well, I mean, in Libertalia, I mean, right. for people who enjoy the game, the fun of the game is trying to outguess everyone else. Because it's, it's yeah. similar to Dungeon Lords in that you know, I mean, from the beginning yeah, in, of the game, you know this... exactly what everyone else has in hand. Mm-hmm. And then it's moderately easy to track what, every, yeah. what everyone has as they play. In none of these... Like I said, none of these are perfect examples of chaotic systems. I think the idea of chaos is far more interesting than as it pertains to board gaming. Yeah. I think with Libertalia, that's probably a better example at a high player count. My opinion is that games that kind of have this chaotic systems are really presenting the players with, I guess, decisions that are less meaningful than they they should be. I guess what I'm saying is, Chaos in board games are, is generally a design deficiency. What, what about Space Alert? I mean, Space Alert basically is a cooperative game about trying to make sense of that kind of chaotic system, right? The yeah. hurdle in the game is overcoming it, which is an interesting twist. A bit. Yeah, I don't know that I would call that really a chaotic system. I mean, it's. I guess, I guess you could say it approximates that in that, you know, if you mess up one movement then you can have far-reaching consequences yeah but it's it's not really about that because because the consequences are kind of static like if you forgot to move to the blue side then you're just one side too close to the red for the entire game but But you but you're not your output randomness isn't going on a completely unexpected track it's just off by one right but but being off by one is often critically important. In Absolutely, but it's not chaos. So I don't see. I mean, any, by that definition, it, I don't see how any of your other examples are chaotic either. Yes. I don't yeah. know. I think it's pretty clear, but I'm clearly not. I think I have just a, a really big brain block on this one. <laughs> uh, Joshua comments, "Robo Rally." Is that? I think Robo Rally is probably the same thing as Space Alert. Maybe, maybe a little more. Yeah. Because because you're you're programming against someone else who's also programming, right? But what really starts to I think create a chaotic system in something like Libertalia is that you have so many agents, you know, and, and that's that's a feature of real world chaos, right? Like predicting the weather. Mm-hmm. There are quadrillions of molecules in the atmosphere you can approximate that all but it's kind of the sum of all of these random interactions from which the macro randomness comes i think a lot of the examples we give are you know create situations that are clearly trying to rein that in so like knowing libertalia if everyone got completely random cards would be far more chaotic than the kind of perfect information game it is or am i or am i still missing the point on this I don't know. I don't know that it would make any difference. Interesting. Huh. I have a feeling we're going to be continuing to talk about this off podcast some more. Because I'm I'm honestly really intrigued by, by this point. Yes. I just hope that in, anytime we say chaos, you just put some really sick reverb for the final. <laughs> like a guitar riff. Let's, let's talk about some games with some particularly interesting forms of randomness or or interesting random systems we talked about gloomhaven already that you're able to kind of modify as you progress as a character the random attack deck that modifies your attacks that's a really cool system that i that i like a lot with the gloomhaven system i think it illustrates something else in that when you have something that generates a random distribution the feeling of randomness is mitigated over time so Mm -hmm. when you spend 
15 games with your character, the quality of your deck comes out and, and it's less it's less random overall. So when you're making these changes to push your deck to be more positive or less negative, and those are both viable strategies, it gives you it gives you a really cool control over the randomness over time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's really interesting because it kind of plays with the perception of randomness in an interesting way. Yeah. I also marked down Twilight Struggle in that a big part of the strategy of Twilight Struggle is contending with the deck reshuffle and we talked there's a little bit about this i guess in high level deck building play in deck builder games on manipulating the reshuffling but in twilight struggle it's super important because there are essentially only going to be two deck reshuffles in the game and it's a big early war strategy to bury cards right after the first reshuffle very significant cards for your opponent so that you basically don't see them again for the the next half of the game. And then also tracking important cards like scoring cards as they move through the draw and discard decks. And it's something you don't see a whole lot in other games, but it's a key component in Twilight Struggle of factoring in that random element and making it a big part of strategy. Yeah. Just super, I, I love it. Yeah. You get a similar kind of reshuffle management in Dominion. Yeah, that's what I'm saying with deck building. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tragedy Looper is an interesting example because it's a game where, and there's not randomness by my definition, but there's a whole lot of trying to predict what the, the other players are doing. So it's, it's asymmetric. You have essentially a kind of a game master who is trying to get away with a crime and there's a whole bunch of deductive elements that the other players are trying to figure out by kind of testing certain actions and seeing the results so kind of a clue like deduction thing but much more complicated and the dm what i'm calling the dm or the gm i don't think that's actually the title prescribed in the game but the the person who is trying to manipulate the other players has to do a lot of work in thinking through not only kind of the strict deductive capability of a setup but thinking through how the other players are going to react to whatever setup you you create or what other what modifiers you put on the next scene or the next redo because you're kind of going through the same timeline multiple times Mm -hmm. right and, and you're able to change little bits and pieces of that timeline each time you reset it and the other players are getting more information it's a lot of really interesting uncertainty right. in terms of predicting what other players will do and also limiting the possibility space of what they're able to discover. Yeah, so from the player's perspective, it kind of appears as random. And, well, and, it's, and, it's just and a they're... giant system of black boxes. Right, right. Right. So you, you go in and you do a certain thing on this character yeah. and you get an output. Yeah. And you use that output over time, all those outputs, to, to paint a picture that the, yeah, that the yeah. game master knows about. You could imagine like an app that plays the role of the, the game master. Mm-hmm. And then you might say that it is random. Depending on how that AI is set up, yeah. Yeah, sure. But that I, it's an interesting yeah, pers- it's, perspective thing. Yeah, interesting, interesting game system. Time of Crisis, I wrote down, just because it kind of flips where you would expect the random elements to be. So it's a deck builder in which you don't draw your cards randomly off your deck. You actually choose what your hand of cards is going to be each turn. In in some sense, it makes it a much more kind of intense strategic deck building experience because you have that extra layer of decision making. But then it throws in these kind of foreign invaders that can come in on the board and that's a highly randomized system of dice rolls to determine that, which can significantly change the game. I think it works there, but I find that one interesting because that's not where my design instincts would have led me in constructing that game, I think. Pulsar like 2849, we've talked about before, just a brilliant example of input randomness. Yeah, for where sure. Where you get, it's a dice drafting thing, but... 
the dice draft is weighted with certain parameters and kind of incentives built into the system yeah. of, of just selecting the dice that you're going to use to, to choose actions later. It's really a great illustration of how a really thick euro can just be made so interesting by injecting randomness in oh, a yeah. certain, certain place. Because other than the dice drafting, it, it, it is a heavy euro with yeah, medium last last podcast it was i was calling things a light euro yeah <laughs> <laughs> nah, they're medium okay, everything's a medium euro <laughs> most euros we have are medium euros it's it's not a it's not <laughs> that even distribution. Di- distribution it's more of a normal <laughs> yeah but it's a euro through and through with very you know actions that are very kind of deterministic so yeah the, there's the, there's a little bit of output randomness on when you're exploring planets right yes but so that, that's not super significant. The brilliance of the dice drafting at the beginning of the round, which we've seen some crazy random, you know, if you get a dice roll where where you have a bunch of ones and twos when you really wanted a five. Oh, yeah. The um, five becomes super punishing to take. Super punishing to take, but it might be worth it. I think the it, brilliance it, of that system is that it's really interesting and engaging and feels fair regardless of what the actual dice values are. Yeah, well said. Five tribes is an interesting example because you're effectively, part of the game is manipulating the input randomness of the player whose turn is next because it's all played out on the central board and your turn will change the starting parameters for the next person's decision making, which I suppose you see that kind of thing a lot in many games, but not to that extent. So like in Castles of Burgundy, you draft a tile, you know, everyone else doesn't have access to that tile. But part of what makes Five Tribes interesting and also can make it drag on a lot is that you change the game state significantly and the board state significantly before each player's turn. The person before manipulates it a lot. Yeah, it's kind of random in a macro sense, but when you get down to actually playing it, you just can't look ahead more than one round. Oh, sure, yeah. As far as the decisions that you're presented with, you're kind of presented with a board on your turn, you decide what to do, and then the next person does it, and you just can't look too far ahead. Yeah, but you. Which, which, when it is your turn, though, part of your decision-making, at least in decent play of Five Tribes, is making sure you're not setting up a killer turn for the right, next right, person. Right. I guess what I'm saying is there's, it's not really a matter of randomness. Not really. I mean, it's just the input is... The, the, the board state you're presented with is just completely different than it was the yeah. previous turn because right, of, right, of the player right. uh, decisions. And then, of course, I've got to bring up Netrunner, which has one of the coolest kind of super random elements that I've seen in any game, in a highly strategic game, and that's uh, the Psy game element, which is essentially a modified rock, paper, scissors, but it's modified in such cool ways, where in a Psy game, what will happen is that both players will secretly do a simultaneous bid of zero, one, or two credits, which is your... Your, your currency in the game. And typically the corporation wants the values to be different and the runner wants the values to be the same. So in some sense, it's a rock, paper, scissors thing where instead of a 50-50 odds, it's two thirds and one thirds odds. But since you're bidding your credits, there's an entire layer, new layer of psychological decision-making in, okay, are they going to be willing to spend two credits here to try to get through this server or avoid this trap? Sometimes as a corporation, you set up side game traps just to tax the runner and you know going in, you're always going to bid zero and then they have to bid one to get through it. And sometimes you're really looking at the state of the game and trying to figure out the kind of decision making that the other person's going to be employing it and trying to weigh this particular instance against their economic state in the game and oh, it's, it's just so cool pour one out for nutrunner <laughs> i guess it's not dead yet worlds is coming up it's gonna die in like a month or two were there any games that you wanted to highlight in terms of interesting random facets dice forge is interesting 
because it's a game where you're rolling the same dice a bunch of times, but you have some control over those faces. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because it kind of feels strange to pay resources to change just something that's going to only be relevant one-sixth of the time. But you roll the dice so many times that it becomes relevant. You roll the dice a ton in that game. Way more than... You would think you would in think, like a 45 yeah. minute game. Yeah. yeah. Which I mean, it has to be that way for the game yeah. to function. Yeah. But that's a cool, uh, you know, that, that's a, that's another cool thing where you just have these two dice that you're rolling, but it, it it's the, it, it's the averaging out over time that basically mm -hmm. makes it interesting. Joshua in the chat, in addition to shouting no, I think at some point during our chaos discussion, sorry, I was really using all my brain power to not read the chat and instead try to think through things that are seem like they're partitioned in my mind as a barrier mentions aeon's end which i haven't played but apparently is a deck builder kind of game where you choose the order in which you discard your cards and then you don't shuffle the deck you just flip over the discard pile which is really cool i can't think yeah, of any other game you... that does that you're doing a deck builder episode. Uh, oh yeah, in pretty the near soon, future, right? Yeah. yeah, I think that's one of the games we'll probably be talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think we could really get into the detailed decisions that you have to make in a game like Dominion. I think that the mm -hmm. randomness in the in the Dominion deck is incredibly interesting. But yeah, we'll get to that in the, in the future podcast. All right, I think we have kind of exhausted a very shallow overview at randomness honestly i'm inspired now to like list a couple topics we could do future podcasts on just kind of inspired by this discussion yeah i think it'd be really cool so this this might be a starting point to kind of a deeper look into i hope you can salvage games. a coherent conversation out, out of what we just had i i will be able to salvage a conversation I can promise you that much out of editing this thing. Thanks for listening, everybody. Unfortunately, we, Ryan dropped out. He was on a train and now is, uh, where was he going? Vancouver or Vancouver. something? Vancouver. Yeah, he's in Canada. Now. I don't think they have the internet in Canada. Oh, is it really? Is it, they're living on the dark ages there, huh? That's why I assume he dropped off. <laughs> as soon as he crossed the border, it just shuts off. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Check out the thoughtfulgamer.com for all kinds of cool reviews and writings and discussions and generally good stuff man that was a rigging endorsement i just gave myself <laughs> if you've made it through this government <laughs> it's this like 12 30 in the morning it's, it's early yeah the duncan has worn off they yeah, the didn't coffee. have boston cream donuts so if you've made it this far i mean you made it this far without your your boston cream donut but uh, <laughs> check me out on social media on twitter and on facebook don't forget to rate and review this podcast on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts from and if you would like to watch our recordings live chime in and discuss things with us as we ramble on about obtuse topics go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer we appreciate any and all support that you all out there in the internet world can provide goodbye everybody good night